Right. If you're a Christian because it makes you feel good, what happens when you actually encounter the kind of persecution the New Testament talks about that we should expect? Well, you're going to chuck your faith. Got a great video for you today, but I just want to remind you that my new book, Another Gospel, is coming out very soon. You can go to alisachilders.com slash another gospel to check out the bonuses you'll get for pre-ordering before October 6th. alisachilders.com slash another gospel. Hey friends, welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. We're going to talk with Sean McDowell today about deconstruction. I wanted to have Sean on the show because he has had several public conversations with Christians who have been through some kind of a process of deconstruction. And so our goal today is to try and understand this process better and help equip ourselves to help our friends who might be going through their own process of deconstruction. I also realize there may be people watching who are going through it themselves, and our goal is to help you through it also. But first, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Impact 360. This is a ministry, actually, that Sean and I both work closely with, and they're located in the beautiful mountains of Pine Mountain, Georgia. And they essentially exist to help equip the next generation of Christian leaders to live out their faith in the world, which is becoming more difficult. Even for adults, it's becoming more difficult. So one of the ways that you can connect with Impact 360 is to check out their online resource called the Gen Z Lab. The Gen Z Lab has two seasons worth of exclusive content answering really tough questions with the goal of helping you to help the younger people in your life uh, to help equip them. So check out impact360.org for more information. Well, I'm here with Sean McDowell, who, gosh, public speaker, professor, apologist, author of several books. You know Sean. He does all the things. So, Sean, it's so great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for, for coming on. Yeah, you bet, Elisa. Been looking forward to it. Well, I saw your discussion with John Steingart from Hawk Nelson on the Unbelievable podcast. And just to give the listeners a little background, we have been seeing more deconstruction stories in our news feeds as time goes on. And a lot of those are coming from the Christian music industry. And so recently, John Steingart, who is the lead singer of the band Hawk Nelson, posted on Instagram that he had gone through this process of doubt and deconstruction and essentially walked away from his faith. And so Sean reached out to John and asked if he'd be willing to have a conversation. And so they did that on the Unbelievable podcast. And honestly, my opinion and also the opinion of a lot of other people I've talked to and seen comments from is just that it was such a grace-filled conversation, both of mm. you guys interacting with each other, uh, just with kindness and I mean, definitely disagreement, but it was just very sure. constructive, you know? And so then you invited him onto your podcast, and that was a great conversation. And from what it looks like, there's possibly going to be more conversations happen with John. And that's exciting because I think in several of the deconstruction stories that I've seen, there's not really a willingness to talk further. I've even seen a couple of people at the end say, well, you know, and, and if you're Christian, don't don't try to change my mind. Don't send me books. Don't send me mm. recommendations or articles. But John seems very open. And so it's kind of, it's neat getting to watch that play out publicly. And so this is something, Sean, that you've done several times. You've had conversations publicly with Christians who have walked through some kind of a deconstruction process. And in some time, sometimes you have a similar background, and I'm thinking in particular with your discussion with Bart Campolo, who grew up with a famous evangelist father. You grew up with a famous evangelist father, who is Josh McDowell, if nobody's put that together yet. <laughs> and um, you went through a time of doubt. Bart went through a time of doubt, you, but you both ended up ultimately going in different directions. And so I want to ask you first, just to lay the foundation for this conversation, to tell us about your time of doubt. I know you've been on the podcast before and shared a little bit about that, but for anyone who's unfamiliar, uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. You mentioned my father, so I'm guessing a lot of people listening to this would know he's written 150 some books, I think 250 some debates just had a monumental influence over the past half century. And so I grew up 
uh, basically hearing not only the gospel, but hearing apologetics. And it made sense to me. I think looking back, I if someone had said, why do you think people aren't Christians? My answer, I wouldn't have chosen these words, but I probably would have thought, well, they just haven't read more than a carpenter or evidence that demands a verdict. Like, how hard is it? The right, evidence right. is there. And then, you know, I get into college, even at Biola, interestingly enough, and this is mid 90s when you can really start searching the net before Google, but people are starting blogs. And much of the secular web began responding to my dad's book, Evidence, chapter by chapter. Mm. And somehow I stumbled across it, just surfing the internet, and it really caught me off guard. It was, it was just deeply unsettling. We're talking doctors and lawyers and historians and at least the, I've looked back at some of those articles and thought, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I was taken by this. So much of it was nonsense, like mythicism. Yeah. But at the time, I didn't have a clue. I'm probably probably about 19 years old. And it was really the first time I thought, oh, my goodness, my parents mean well, but what if I'm wrong? Mm. And I just hadn't had that thought on an existential level before. And I remember just laying in my bed at night, just thinking, Kai, if this isn't true, this changes everything. And it just, it, it bothered me. And so I, I decided I was going to have a conversation with my dad and we were in Breckenridge, Colorado, up in the mountains, beautiful ski town. I said, dad, could we have a conversation? He goes, sure. And I just, you know, as best I remember, I said, dad, I want to know what's truth. I just don't know that I'm convinced Christianity is true, not knowing how my dad is going to respond. And he responded exactly how my mind would have told me that he would respond, but I was emotionally questioning things too. And he said to me, he goes, son, I think that's great. And like pause. And I remember thinking like with my hand, dad, did you hear anything that I just said? <laughs> he goes, look, I didn't raise you to believe stuff just because I said so. I've raised you to seek after truth. And I know if you seek after truth, you'll keep believing in Jesus. And you know, your mom and I will love you no matter what was essentially the gist of it. And my dad's, you know, the cup is 99% full anyways with him. It's just how he chooses to see the world. And I don't think I ever stopped believing, but that was a real point for me where it was like, okay, I got to know why I believe. I got to figure this, if I'm going to base my life on this, if I'm going to go into any kind of Christian ministry. And that was really when I started reading works from different perspectives and just piecing through, giving myself permission to doubt and ask questions. And I happened to be at Biola, so I went and talked to people like J.P. Moreland, who helped me out. I, Greg Kokel oh. was there speaking. So I just had a wealth of resources. And the funny thing is, you know, people are like, well, how did your dad help you during this time? And I'm like, you know what? Sometimes when you grow up, it doesn't matter who your dad is. You just need somebody else, like a mentor to yeah. weigh in and probably say the same things. Yeah. But it was people like JP and Greg Kokel and William and Craig that really helped me, you know, amongst other things I was working through in my life, just come to grips with, okay, this is true. And I have good reason to mm -hmm. believe that it's true. I, I just got to meet JP a while back at a Biola on the Road conference and spend a little time with him over the course of a couple of days. What a dear man, huh? Yes, yeah. he is. Have you ever talked to your dad since that point and asked him what was going through his head in that conversation? Because I, I would imagine, yes, he's, I mean, that, that's such a powerful thing for a parent to do, to sort of release their child into the world and say, okay, you have to figure this out for yourself. And if it's not true... Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't believe it. Have you ever asked him about maybe what was going through his mind? Or was he nervous? You know, we we've actually talked about this quite a bit because when we speak together, people will ask me to share my story and his story, and we kind of contrast him. And this was now, if I remember, maybe three, four, five years ago. I was like, Dad, what were you really thinking? And he goes, Son, I wasn't, I wasn't really worried. And I said, Why? And he said, Because I knew the depth of relationship that we had together. And that's not what I expected him to say. I expected yeah. him to say, because the evidence is so strong. He goes, no, I just knew that you weren't angry. I knew that mm -hmm. you weren't just rejecting something to rebel. I knew we had a good relationship and you're figuring stuff out that people naturally figure out. So that yeah. was his response. And the funny thing is people ask me to share the story all the time. And growing up in Christian circles, you hear these dramatic testimonies. I'm like, man, if God's going to use me, I got to come out of prison or come out of a gang or <laughs> yeah. just do something crazy. And all the time I look back, I'm like, oh, God can use all of our stories in some fashion to encourage and inspire people no matter what our, our past is. Well, one thing that you consistently seem to, to get your finger on when you have these conversations, uh, and particularly with Bart Campolo, this 
this stood out to me so much. I ended up writing a blog post about it because, mm. because of the similarity of backstory and then going through doubt and then ultimately landing in complete opposite directions. On that podcast, Justin asked each of you, why, you know, essentially why you're a Christian. And uh, I remember Bart telling a story that I know a lot of church kids relate with. I related with this story growing up in church where he was at a youth event and he felt what he identified as the presence of God and he had this transcendent experience. But then he went on to say, you know, but, but as I grew and as I doubted, I sort of realized that lots of different places can give you a transcendent experience. And I think whatever you're sort of, I mean, I'm paraphrasing him, but whatever you're sentimentally connected to when you have that experience kind of bonds you to it. And so his reason for being a Christian was this transcendent experience. And then it was such a stark contrast when it came to you. And you essentially said, well, I'm a Christian because I believe it's actually evidentially and factually true. And this is a point mm. I think that you continue to press on. And you touched on this, I think, with your conversation with John, when you asked him a similar question, John, what did it mean? You know, was there a moment when you knew you were a Christian or when you became a Christian? I forget how you asked him, but and he gave an answer, and then you you pressed a little more and said, you know, for me, it was when I, I realized that I was a sinner and I needed a savior. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've been thinking through a lot, just as I see these deconstruction stories. And I just know for me, when I went through my own doubt and deconstruction process, the one thing, no matter how intellectually confused I was about what was true or what was not true, the one thing I was really deeply aware of that I couldn't let go was how deep, deeply I was a sinner and I desperately huh. needed a savior. And so that's why I was so depressed at the thought of Christianity not being true, because it, it gives an answer for that. And so I noticed that you pressed this a bit. And so with, with the intellectual component, you know, that was extremely important in my process. And as apologists, we love to talk about the evidence and I, I, I love the evidence too. And, but, but I think that was an important point that you brought up uh, for the Christian, like that moment of conversion, it's a realization of our sinfulness. And I wonder if you might just unpack that a little bit. Yeah, I've had dozens of these conversations, some on air with people like Bart Campolo and Ryan Bell and others, and quite a few, even a lot more off. And I haven't seen a study on this, so if somebody listening to this has a study, send me a link. But I've never talked to a former believer when I ask him the experience that's defining in their faith. And the experience is, man, I realized I was a sinner and I yeah. needed God's grace of transformation. I'm sure there's some people out there that would say this. I'm not denying their experience, yeah. but time and time again, it's like I wanted to be a part of a movement or I felt God in worship or I felt God in creation or I just wanted to be on the side of justice, which mm -hmm. are all fine. But what's the defining experience of being a Christian? It's recognizing your sinfulness and crying out to God for in, in repentance for forgiveness. Wow. And if you haven't had that experience, I think it's a fair question to ask, were you ever truly in the faith, even if you were a part of a club, even if you went to church and did all the practices, to me, that's the defining experience. So I think there's an awful lot of people who were preaching, writing books, leading the church and leave but I'm not sure they ever were in the faith yeah. to begin with. And of course, only God knows that. And I can't judge anybody's heart, but I'm just talking from dozens of dozens of experiences. Uh, that seems to not happen. I'll tell you one, at least I was speaking with a, somebody off air who had recently left ministry. And he said, I just don't feel like I can experience God. And he's asking me all these questions. I'm doing my best to answer apologetically for about 45 minutes. Yeah. And at the end, he says to me, he goes, do you have any last advice for me? He was really open and just congenial the way that John Steingart is, just mm -hmm, willing mm -hmm. to have this conversation. And I said, this guy said, you know, here's all I know is whenever I see people leave the faith in some public ministry, I never have had somebody tell me they had an experience of an awareness of their sinfulness and crying out to God for their grace. So can you tell me what was that experience like for you? It was like looking at a deer in the headlights. Yeah. He froze. 
and was like, I've never had that experience. Wow. And I just sat there. I'm like, this guy has been leading hundreds of people in ministry, Mm -hmm. speaking and preaching and counseling. And I said, well, what's holding you back? He goes, well, I guess I'm afraid what I would discover if I really probed into my own sinfulness. Wow. And I just said all these other questions about God doing miracles and experiencing him today. That's the starting point. That's the starting point. If you want to experience God, it begins with crying out for his grace and forgiveness. And it was like in all the years in ministry, no leader had asked him that question. But because he was articulate, because he was good with students, throw him up on stage, give him a huge platform and never even probe that experience. So that's woken me up to how important it is that not only is this true, which can help guard our hearts, but is there a recognition of our own sinfulness? That's the defining experience. Because that's the gospel. And I think hearing you press this in your conversations has helped make sense of a bit of my story because, you know, going back, growing up in the church, I I, I know that I was a Christian. I, I was aware of my sinfulness, even as a Christian, uh, wandering off the path at times and knowing how desperately I needed God's grace just desperately. And, mm. and so, but my, ex, my faith was informed by, I, I believe a real born again experience, but evidentially I had nothing except my feelings. So that's where I related with Bart's mm. story of feeling what I identified as the presence of God in worship. But then when I was going through doubt and deconstruction, being convinced by an agnostic that those feelings were just synapses in my brain that were firing, much like what Bart said, firing in response to some kind of sociological stimuli that that I connected with on an emotional level. And so, you know, that made that seem true to me. Um, but, but there is this other component, you know, that I think even when we talk about evidence, a lot of Christians can, can miss and can skip over because ultimately being a Christian isn't just giving intellectual assent to some some doctrines. It's not like checking the boxes and saying, okay, I've checked my boxes. I'm good. It, it is, Jesus said to, to uh, oh, Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. If you, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, you, you must be born again. And there's this born again experience. And so I've been thinking a lot about this too, because my dad just wrote his life story into a book. And so, wow. yeah, he became a Christian in the late, I guess, late 60s, early 70s, and the whole Jesus People movement in Orange County. And he actually talks about searching for God. And so he and his hippie friends were trying to live according to the Bible. And so they were following as best they could to obey the Bible. And they were actually preaching and witnessing to other hippie friends. But because they hadn't had that moment of being aware of their sinfulness and having that born again experience, my dad in his book talks about how he would try to get people to do LSD while he preached to them (laughs) because he thought that's how you really could understand the Bible. And so when, when he went to Calvary Chapel and heard Chuck Smith preach sin and repentance and just the pure gospel, he just said it was like this light went on and he realized that in this moment and he was utterly transformed and born again that night and nothing was ever the same in his life. And so that actually made me think about your dad too, because both of our dads came to faith later, not, you know, they, they weren't, they didn't grow up in this sort of evangelical culture that we did. And there was a comment someone left on my Facebook page where he said, I, I became a Christian at 27, so there was nothing to deconstruct. And so I think mm-hmm. about your dad, whose faith was so carefully constructed, and which I think safeguards from that deconstruction process. I wonder if you would, would have anything, any thoughts about that, about your dad coming to faith later from atheism uh, with the, the constructing of your faith being such an important element. I, I would say a couple things about my dad's experience. He, he probably wouldn't define himself directly as an atheist like Strobel would. I think he'd say he's more of an agnostic. Okay. Uh, but he certainly didn't believe and he set out to disprove it. But it, interestingly enough, wasn't the evidence that convinced my father to become a believer. The evidence, the way he would phrase it, is it got his attention and made him pause and think, wow, this could really be true. It was the love of God that when he understood Mm. what it meant to have a loving heavenly father. So you'll hear him frequently quote in Romans how it says it's your kindness that leads to repentance. And so for my dad, the barriers were equally emotional and intellectual. Mm. Emotionally, people would say things like, hey, you have a heavenly father who loves you. 
my dad's like father mm. father's equal drunk abusive you know figures in my life why on earth would i want a heavenly cosmic figure right. who's even more so of that that was just an emotional turnoff but when he realized it was true and then especially a pastor at a church who began to mentor him in the scriptures and help him understand the love of god you put those two together that's where really you know the power of god and obviously through the holy spirit i'm not leaving yeah, all that yeah. out but from his perspective it was understanding the love of god and it being true together which is why i think both of those have to go together i think it's unhealthy when we have just an experiential faith and it's unhealthy when somebody has just a truth based faith mm -hmm. and this is in, in the book jay warner wallace and i wrote on uh, helping the next generation i started to realize that my apologist friends are like truth, truth, truth. Mm -hmm. And my youth pastor friends are like relationship, relationship, relationship yeah. experience. And Jim and I are like, it's both. Both need correction back to the middle. So I think with my dad, because his experience was so powerful of coming to forgive his own father, what gave him more confidence when it's all said and done was less the evidence, but just the power of his ability to forgive his dad. Wow. That's when, when he, he actually said to me, he, he had become a believer. And once he became a Christian, it took maybe, I think he said six months to a year that God really softened his heart. And he was with his dad going to, I can't remember what he was going to meet with his dad and tell him. And he goes, he told me, he goes, son, out of my lips came the word, came the words, I love you to his dad. Wow. And he wasn't even planning on saying that. He goes, at that moment, I knew it was real. It was that experience which confirmed which his mind told him was true. Oh, wow, that's powerful. And I think there's something to that relational element that I think can trip a lot of people up in their understanding of who God is and what is taught in the Bible. And one example of that, you know, you mentioned your father sort of having this like, why would I want a cosmic father when fathers are X, Y, Z because of his experience. And, you know, often we hear this claim of the atonement being something like cosmic child abuse, where you have this mm -hmm. vengeful, hateful father that just wants a whipping boy, just wants to punish his son. And um, I actually had a woman walk come up to me after a, uh, I think, I can't remember if I had led worship or if it was an apologetics thing, but I had said something that referenced the wrath of God and, and, so, some legal element in the atonement. And she said, I believe what you're saying, but it's so hard for me. Like, I want to shut down when you start talking about that because mm. my dad was abusive. He was wrathful. He was drunk all the time. And he'd fly into these drunken rages and abuse us. And she's like, how, how can I reconcile those two things? And I think that, that that is a huge component of the emotional block I think people have uh that that can play a role in the in the deconstruction process and another thing that came up in your conversation with john i think it was your first conversation with john is i think he even mentioned it it was something having to do with being a christian for the benefit and i thought the conversation was really interesting right there and i think it inspired you actually to write a recent blog post in fact i'm mm. going to put it on the screen here for people to see where it says don't teach don't teach your uh, kids to be Christians for the benefit. Teach them to be Christian because it's true. And I wonder if you might comment on this because you talk about this meeting you had with some Christian kids over lunch. So set, set the, the groundwork for this blog post a little bit and then let's talk through it because I think it's helpful for people to understand the deconstruction process because we have, to, we have a starting point that's really important. Yeah, this is a few years ago. I was invited to speak at this student conference all day, Worldview Apologetics. And then at lunch, this group of students, there's probably six or seven, if I remember, from a local youth group, invited me to lunch. And I was about to take off, but it was Italian. So I was like, yeah, I'll carve out some time. We'll go to Italian. And we're just sitting around talking about sports, the weather, whatever. And I thought, you know what, let's make this interesting. So I said, I'm curious. You guys have all been in, in the faith for, for years. I said, tell me why you're a Christian. I just want to hear. And these are students in Christian homes, in youth group, leading worship, et cetera. And as I went around, their answers were like, well, I enjoy it. Yeah. Well, my friends are here. 
it makes me feel good. I'm a part of something bigger than myself. Uh, my parents are Christians. And listening, I'm sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, how do we have kids who are 16, 17, 18 years old? And that's the basis of their belief. Mm. I mean, if you're a Christian because your friends go there, when your friends go somewhere else, you're going to bail. Right. If you're a Christian because it makes you feel good. What happens when you actually encounter the kind of persecution the New Testament talks about that we should expect? Well, you're going to chuck your faith. So it just hit me at that point. I was like, wow, the basis of our faith is so experiential. It's so benefit oriented. Uh, we are doing students a disservice. So, yeah, that conversation with, with John just burned my mind. I was like, I just want to emphasize to people when we raise up our kids, don't tell them, oh, be Christians because you'll get A, B, and C, which is really a kind of prosperity gospel. Yes. Rather be a Christian because it's actually true. In fact, if it's not true, don't be a Christian and give it up. Yeah. And sadly, people can go through the church their entire life, their entire lives right now, and never hear simple apologetics, never learn basic theology. And that's just heartbreaking. Something yeah. has to change in the church because of that. And when we talk about Christianity being true or false, the cool thing about Christianity, which actually sounds like a scary thing at first, is that you can actually, you could, you could prove it false. It's falsifiable. And I wonder if you talk about that a little bit, because this, in your conversations that you have with these deconverted Christians, it always goes to the first thing we talked about, this, this experience of understanding your own sinfulness and needing a savior. But there's all, it also swings back around to the resurrection. So I wonder if you could just, in trying to help our listeners today to have better conversations with friends who might be in their own kind of deconstruction processes or people who are watching who might be going through a deconstruction process, uh, what role does the resurrection play? Yeah, I sent out a tweet last week thinking about this very thing, something like, let's keep the main thing the main thing. If the resurrection happened, Christianity's true. If it didn't, it's false. It's really that simple. So I meet a lot of people who have deconstructed their faith because they find what they think is a contradiction in the Bible, or they don't understand or believe the Bible is inerrant anymore. And that's like a crack that leads to them chucking their entire faith entirely. Now, I don't believe there's contradictions in the Bible. I believe in inerrancy, but at the heart of my faith, heart of our faith is the resurrection. Even if there were a contradiction, even if the Bible was not inerrant and Jesus rose from the grave, Christianity would still be true. So I say this not to downplay those, but to raise up the heart of our faith, the resurrection, and say, let's start there. Mm. That if Jesus has risen from the grave, how did he view scripture? How did he use scripture? It's kind of a, yeah. a tactical move that says, let's take these important but secondary issues, move them to the side and get to the question, who is Jesus? And since Jesus pointed to the resurrection as his ult the ultimate vindication of his identity and authority, yeah. let's see if this is true. And you don't need an inspired and errant Bible to get there. You just need a basic historical approach. So this is just kind of a tactical move with somebody because I found that when I'm in conversations, people get very hung up on important but secondary issues and aren't really able to prioritize even in their minds, like how important is the existence of God versus the way we should baptize? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, obviously one, yes. and that's somewhat of an extreme example, but even like the age of the earth versus the existence of God and you know naturalism versus theism. Let's get to the heart of the issue and then we can move to those important secondary issues. I just found that more helpful with people. And it's very effective in conversation as I've, you know, watched and listened to some of these conversations. It definitely causes the other person to have to think about what what they make of the evidence for the resurrection. And uh, I've even had conversations with people who are going through extreme doubt and just said kind of similar to what you just said, let's just put the whatever, how we want to view the Bible aside for a second. And here, here are the facts that most scholars agree on surrounding the resurrection. You know, here's what I think makes best sense of the evidence, but if you're going to reject it, you got to come up with a better explanation. And then that, you know, and I've had mm. people even say, 
at that moment, like, well, I think I don't want it to be true. And that's why I, wow. I, I've actually had people be that honest. And so then that's a different, you know, that ex kind of exposes maybe a different reason the deconstruction might be happening. And so, because I think it's so easy for us, uh, especially apologists, to just be like, well, let, let me just give you the evidence and you'll be set, you know, because, but there are a lot of different reasons that people experience doubt and go through their deconstructions. But I love that you, you, you parse these things out so carefully because it makes me think of Jay Warner Wallace's story, which, you know, you've co-written books with him. We both know him. Cold case homicide detective in Los Angeles, as skeptical as they come. And yet he became a Christian based on the evidence. And he even talked about there's not all, in fact, not only is there not always a benefit, it's actually detrimental sometimes to my life. And yeah. he wrote this in a blog post that I just want to quote this because I use this quote a lot because it's so good. But he said this, he said, Christianity is not easy. It doesn't always work for me. There are times when I think it would be easier to do it the old way, easier to cut a mm. corner or take a shortcut. There are times when doing the right thing means doing the most difficult thing possible. There are also times when it seems like non-Christians have it easier or seem to be winning. It's in times like these that I have to remind myself that I'm not a Christian because it serves my own selfish purposes. I'm not a Christian because it works for me. I had a life prior to Christianity that seemed to be working just fine, and my life as a Christian hasn't always been easy. And I, I love this quote in particular because he references that I had a life prior to Christianity that seemed to be working out just fine. He was highly successful, had a good marriage, he was happy. And so I think, again, just sort of looking at the foundation to, to construct a correct faith, a good faith, you know, it's important that we understand that Christianity isn't going to just give you this great life. As you mentioned, that's that's more like what the prosperity gospel teaches. But I think some of us were raised with those promise books that took all kinds of verses out of context, you know, just pick anything that sounds good out of the Bible and apply it to your life. And, and then we can be utterly surprised when we're hit with hardship or something that mm. doesn't seem to fit well. And so, Sean, you work a lot with young people. Um, so as someone who works with that, generation of young people, what can people in our generation do better to help, in your opinion, your experience, to help the younger generation, like our kids, develop a more lasting faith? That's a great question. And there's nobody who did this better than Ravi Zacharias. And what I mean by this is finding the question behind the question. Yes. In one sense, I think Jay Warner is, he's pretty unique in a lot of senses, but in his just... It, his rational, careful, evidential approach to the faith before he was even a believer and his commitment to truth, I think is pretty unique. I don't think most people are that systematic and careful and logical and committed to following truth wherever it leads. I'd actually say for most people, the barriers are more moral and emotional and relational than they are intellectual. But it sounds more sophisticated to say, hey, I just think there's contradictions in the Bible yeah. than to admit, well, I just was disappointed and things didn't pan out as I thought they would. So that doesn't mean we don't take intellectual questions seriously. But every conversation I'm in, I'm always asking myself, what's the heart of the question and how do I address the heart of the question? Mm. So I was having a conversation with a young man. He just graduated from high school, was heading to university. and. Uh, I did this atheist role play. You probably see me do put glasses on, mm. pretend I'm an atheist. And when I was done, this kid came out to me. He goes, he goes, that was really interesting. He goes, I'm an atheist. I just recently left my faith. Can we talk? I was like, sure. So we sat out and, and we were talking. He's asking me these questions about ancient Hinduism and like these abstract questions. And I'm thinking, I just have a hard time believing an 18 year old kid is really hung up on this. So I just said to him, I said, look, I could be totally off base, but my suspicion is that these questions you're asking me aren't really the issue for you. I said, what is the real issue? Why did you actually leave your faith? Mm. And why are you reluctant to come back? And he says to me, he goes, well, I just graduated and I'm going to the university. I joined a frat and I just want to have fun for a while. I said, okay, now we're actually talking. Yeah. This is a very different conversation. It wasn't apologetic. It's his understanding that Christianity, again, we're almost always back to this. 
is legalistic and it's no fun and it's been framed in a way of what I get out of it. So when it looks like I get something out of it, a benefit somewhere else, then I give this Christian thing up. Well, for me, when I studied the apostles, Lisa, it was amazing. I read the entire New Testament carefully, paying attention to every single time the Bible said either we should expect to suffer or be persecuted mm. or gave an example of the apostles and followers of Christ suffering and being persecuted. I was stunned at how central this is. Mm a biblical idea through all of the New Testament. Partly disappointed myself, I'm like, how did I miss this? Because this prosperity gospel has been preached in so many ways. Yeah. And this is a separate conversation. We'd also see it with like the sexual purity thing. If you're just faithful now, your benefit will be God will bless you yeah. with that spouse and you'll have the most wonderful relationship ever. And it's like, it doesn't work out. They bail on God. Right. So we've, taught the gospel in a false way to this generation. So for me back, you know, I guess to bring back one more point, when I talk about like the resurrection, I try to talk about how here's the evidence for it. But I also try to say, you know what, if you reflect on your heart, I think you actually want a world that's this way. I think within your heart, there's something that resonates. You know, in my conversation with, with John and Unbelievable, I was like, look at the movie Endgame. It climaxes with Iron Man laying down his life, the only way to save everybody. Mm -hmm. There's something that draws our heart to that. Well, guess what? That's actually true. So I think with this generation, we have to show them this is true and there's good reason why, but also here's what it actually means and here's why this really is good news. I don't think we've done either of those very well. That is a powerful point because you, you even mentioned in your conversation with John, uh, and I think you even isolated this as a clip on Twitter that, that was so powerful about there being this cry in our hearts, which is why we resonate with Iron Man giving his life for the whole world, because that's mm. a story that we're actually wired to, to cry out for because of the plan of God of salvation of Jesus being ultimately that sacrificial lamb giving his life for the whole world. That's why, you know, we relate with that. That's why that's so powerful to us. And just swinging back to your conversation with John, I wonder if we could, I, 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 I didn't know this about you, but you mentioned that you had spent some time uh, touring with Rebecca St. James uh, back in the day. <laughs> I can't believe our paths didn't cross because what year was that? That was... Would that have been like late nineties or? Yeah. So I, I have to qualify this. Okay. I didn't mean that I toured with Rebecca St. James. I have zero musical ability, <laughs> but it, in the nineties, what my father started doing is it was the very first time you'd have these Christian events with a Christian rock band to draw students. And then they'd hear the gospel. So he traveled yeah. with Petra, traveled with the Newsboys, and then late 90s, early 2000s, somewhere around then, I worked for my dad for a year, and he was on the road doing these concerts and events with Rebecca St. James. Gotcha. So I got to see all of, hey, jump in the bus, go save yeah. the city, be backstage, just experience that. Plus, growing up, I mean, all these creation conferences and Jesus Northwest, I mean, I went to these where there's, I don't know, 100,000 plus people, and I'd be sneaking backstage and just getting a sense of what it was really like behind the scenes yeah. for a lot of these rock stars and speakers who are just huge platform people in the Christian world. So you observed the the platform, and I, you know, I wanted to bring this up because I related so deeply with some things John mentioned, I think it was in the first conversation, about... And I felt this way, and I was a very sincere Christian too, not perfect in any way, but really had a sincere love for Jesus. And you are, and John made this point, you're instantly propelled into this pastoral role. That's his word. He's like, it's a pastoral role. And I just remember, uh, and I, I, I bring this up because I watched recently a video of an ex-Christian, or at least, I don't know, maybe she's a progressive Christian, but she has this YouTube channel and she had gone around and interviewed some people who are no longer in the Christian industry who have kind of deconstructed in one way or another. And they all said very similar things about the platform. And one of the girls in particular would talk about how people would send notes back like you looked too sexy or this this was this way and it uh. seemed so legalist and we we got notes 
<laughs> sent back to us all the time, like, like your pants are too wow. tight and you're going to stump, you know, and all this stuff. And, and, you know, and we're just like 25 years old and I'm like, I've just been eating pizza every night. So my pants are like really tight. <laughs> I can't just go, buy. you know, I mean that in my mind, I was thinking like, I don't have an option sure, to just go sure. buy new pants because I gained five pounds, but thanks, you know? And so I think a lot of time there can be an assumption about your motive. And we were pretty naive. Like I look back at some of our videos and go, Ooh, I don't know if I would do that that way again now with <laughs> sure. what I know about men and people and, you know, but, um, I think, you know, getting some of that pushback and then at the same time, we would be out doing an autograph signing or something, which I was never comfortable with anyway, but, you know, we'd have mothers come by and just constantly remind us like, you're a role model, make sure you keep, you know, my daughters look up to uh. you. And the pressure of that was so extreme that in many ways, I sort of get it. I understand just wanting to toss all that away and be like, Christian culture, man, you know, there's some legalistic people. There are some judgmental people. I totally get that. And, and so I related a lot with, with John. And I think that's why when people are public Christians and they deconstruct or deconvert, they do feel the need to share that because, because you don't want to be a fraud. You know, you don't, you don't want to be saying something that you don't actually believe anymore. And, and I, can, I can understand that, and I actually appreciate John's honesty in that. One of the advantages I had growing up with a dad who probably, probably in the 80s and early 90s had as big of a platform as maybe second to Billy Graham or up there, I mean, just speaking all over the place, selling millions of books, is I didn't have certain illusions about what it meant to be a Christian rock star yes, or, you know, speaking star. Cause I saw the pressure and the stress and all these added things that people would send my dad, he'd share with our family and process them. Like it just kind of stripped some of that away from me that I think, you know, he's human as the next person, but it was really clear to me like, wow, these are all vehicles for him to share the gospel and get the message out. It's not about the platform for him when it's all said and done. And so I, I guess I, I've seen that. And I think a lot of people, especially in their 20s, who haven't grown up and seen that, they're thrown on the stage. I mean, it's exciting and it's fun. You don't want to do the smallest thing to wreck your platform, but you don't really have an outlet. Who do I talk to and how do yes. I process doubts? Yes. How do I process if I'm morally failing in an area yes. because I'm going to lose everything? Mm. And what 20-year-old young person can handle this? So it just builds and builds and builds and wrecks them. So this is just a phenomena of Christian circles. We have so many people. I mean, I ask people all the time, like, how do I – you know, how do I get on stage like you? How do I do this? And I'm just thinking, man, have I done something to make people think yeah. that being on stage equals influence? Because it doesn't um, necessarily. There's some people who use it well and are called to this. You look at Jesus, he preaches to big crowds, but he had three around him. He had 12 around him. He taught in small groups and he did both. So I just get concerned that we send the message like to follow God and make a difference is to be a rock star, is to be a speaker, is to have a bigger platform. And that's the rubric of the world, mm. not the rubric of the gospel that says I leave the 99 for the one. You know, you mentioned having no one to process things like uh, doubts or even moral temptations or failings that might be going on. I mean, I relate with that so much because you've got so much riding on your shoulders because it's not just that you've got your own ministry or your own platform riding on your shoulders, but you're employing people who are depending on you to keep the faith and stay on the right path. And there, there's, uh, it's a very complex and complicated sort of business because it is a business you know there are people in the business that have the right heart and um, but it it can it hardens you you know you you tour around and you're yeah. in this floating bubble and I know in my case we were not in church a lot because we were gone most Sundays and so I lost mm. touch with the local church I didn't feel like I had anybody to talk to with my own struggles whatever they may have been so just as we close out here, I, I know there are people watching. I, I get emails from people who say I'm I'm deconstructing, but I'm listening. I I, I don't mm -hmm. want to do it for the wrong reasons. I I want to believe what's true. What would be your advice for people who might be watching who are themselves going through a deconstruction process, or might have a loved one or even a child going through that mm -hmm. kind of process? W what advice would you would you give them? 
We approach this in a couple different ways. When I saw, I sat down to work on a, a, a lecture I was going to do one of my Biola classes and across like Twitter feed was, I don't know who John Steingard was. I had heard of Hog Nelson and I was like, oh gosh, do I have time to write a response? This is going to take me a while. And I thought, you know what? This is, this is worth doing. Had never met him. I uh, hadn't heard of him individually, and I sat down, probably took me two or three hours, and I thought, I'm going to write as truthful but as grace-filled as possible. Maybe he'll read this, maybe, mm-hmm. with that in mind, because sometimes when we comment on social media, we act as if the person doesn't exist <laughs> that we're right. really talking to, yeah. and they do, and people hear stuff today, and it's shared with them, and people are watching and listening to the conversation. So I wrote pretty truthfully based on his post, but I also wrote grace filled and I looked at some of the comments on Instagram and it just broke my heart. I thought, are you kidding me? In his post, he mentions like depression, how painful this was for him and not a lot, but some Christians are piling on. And I thought this is not going to help anybody who already thinks Christians are this way. Mm -hmm. And he's certainly not going to reach out to Christians. It's going to push him the other way. So I just wrote truthful, as gracious as I could. It was Justin Brierley at Unbelievable who sent it to him and said, hey, would you be willing to come on with Sean? He wrote this post. And he read that and was like, wow, that was thoughtful and really kind. That's what started the conversation. The last thing we need to do when somebody's deconstructing their faith is start criticizing them personally and going after them. Now, if somebody comes out with a really strong, aggressive post, Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I might respond a little differently, but most posts are not that way. Most are people who feel like, you know, people are going to attack me personally. I'm making myself vulnerable. I don't want to lose friends. Like John said, he said, I feel like I'm on the outside. Like, let's just err on the side of leading with compassion and grace in this person's life. So when you see somebody questioning, just if there's only one thing you could communicate, I would communicate, say, you know what? I love you and I'm with you no matter what happens in your story. If you only communicate one thing, that's it. That's what my dad communicated to me. That's what I tried to communicate, not to John because I didn't know him, but to anybody listening to this. Hey, there's thoughtful Christians who love and who care and aren't bailing on you. So that's a little harder when it's family versus somebody else. I get that. I get those emails and calls all the time from people. Some somehow people think, again, maybe it's because I have a little bit of a platform that somehow I can magically fix it <laughs> right? and that other people can't, which is so not true. Yeah. But if you can communicate anything to anybody who's questioning. It's, I love you and I stand with you, period. Then when you're ready, let's start talking about the issues. So people who are deconstructing, I would say, I'm sorry if people have been really critical to you and have attacked you, like my heart just breaks. Um, My hope would be that you wouldn't allow those voices to crowd out the thoughtful, caring Christians who want to be a part of your life and your spiritual journey. Ignore those who are either not Christians or they're just in process and need some work themselves Mm -hmm. and find those Christians in your life that you know care about you aren't going to be judgmental, who are going to talk through these issues with you, find them. And also I'd say, if you really want to find the answers, the answers are out there. Not certainty. Uh, This has come up a lot with my Mm. conversation with people who used to believe, like, I'm just not certain anymore. And I go, look, certainty is not the standard. But if you want to know, we can have confidence that this is true. And Christianity actually makes sense to the world. There's answers if you're willing to find it. So you are loved as best you can. Ignore those Christians who are just not living out the gospel. Uh, There's answers if you find them. And then ask yourself the tough question. Do you really know what the gospel is? So if there's a Christian out there that's deconstructing, listen to this, I'd say read the gospel of John with as fresh eyes as you possibly can and just ask, who really is this person, Jesus? That's good stuff. And if anyone's listening or watching, you can go to Sean McDowell. Is it seanmcdowell.org or .com? 
Dot com is some kind of sportscaster. Oh, okay. So, dot org. <laughs> SeanMcDowell.org. Sean has all kinds of resources, blog posts, videos. He's got a great YouTube channel. And we, of course, will link his two discussions with John uh, in the podcast notes for this episode. We'll be praying for you, Sean, as you continue your discussions with John. Be praying for John. And uh, I just appreciate you coming on, and I hope this was helpful for somebody. So thanks, Sean. Well, I do listen to your podcast, Elisa, to oh, a wow. lot of the episodes. So I want you know, I really enjoy the one with Monique. Oh, um, thank so you. big fan. Your voice is really important today. Keep it up. And thanks for having me on. Thanks. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed listening to or watching this podcast, you can go to alisachilders.com and click the subscribe button, or you can subscribe on YouTube or iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast. Don't forget to go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers and take a look at some of the ways that you can come alongside us financially and with your prayers to help get the message out to more people. Have a great week.